Hello, viewers. You join me for a unique interview. I'm going to be speaking to an old friend of mine who's been on the channel an awful lot, who you will remember from the Watchtower in Focus episodes. I am referring, of course, to my good friend, John Redwood, who I think I can finally unveil on this channel as being Mark O'Donnell. <laughs> Mark, thanks so much for joining me. Lloyd, it's great to be here. Thanks a lot, and uh, it's good to see uh, it's good to see you in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah, I thought I'd I'm be getting so hungry. I've been kicked out of the usual recording places, and and the kitchen is like my last stronghold. <laughs> <laughs> I'm forced outside. So yeah, so we're we're now referring to you as your real name. We're, I'm going to have to remember that now for the next Watch Time and Focus episode. So. Obviously, we've been in touch for a while now, and it's just occurred to me that no one, I, I haven't helped you tell your story yet on my channel, and I feel bad about that. So, Well, okay. don't. <laughs> <laughs> don't feel bad, because uh, you, know, you know as well as I do, Lloyd, that this is not about me, and it's not about you. It's about helping people, and you've done a yeah. tremendous job uh, in helping people. So, uh, well, but, true, yeah. true, although sometimes people find it easier to um, take the information when they can relate to the person giving it. So very I'm, I'm true. Sure that although your information has been very helpful over the last couple of years or however long it is that we've been doing Watch Time Focus and indeed JW Survey, it's always nice to put a face to the name and a story to the name. So perhaps we can rewind and you can tell the viewers a little bit about your background with Jehovah's Witnesses. Sure. Well, um, you know, it's a complicated story, but not much unlike other JWs who grew up in the organization. So I was a born in. My parents um, were married in 1961, and I was born in 1967. So uh, I'm an only child. Um, I live in Baltimore, Maryland. I've lived in the same place my entire life. Uh, I grew up in Baltimore City. I live just outside the city limits now. And uh, so back in the late 60s, as you and our listeners know, there was a great push to bring witnesses into the organization. There were quite a few what I would call power couples or power pioneers. And my parents came across a power, uh, power couple who brought them into the organization, got them to meetings, and ultimately got them baptized right about the time I was born they were baptized into the organization. And so this was all part of the run up to 1975, where the growth was, you know, just really, it was really happening at its seemingly exponential rate. So I grew up in the culture of, you know, the world was <clears throat> very close to its end. Um, you know, I was eight years old, <clears throat> seven to eight years old, 1975. And, uh, when that came and went, obviously, uh, I was still a young child, so I accepted the explanation that it was witnesses who got that wrong. And so even they, as a young child, you can remember there being a fuss about that particular year? Yeah, in fact, what I remember most of all is not the fuss over leading up to 1975, because I was young, and I, and I do remember it, but what I remember the most was the strong opposition to the idea that the Watchtower organization or Jehovah's Witnesses came up with that. It was the explanation given to us was that people ran ahead. That's a very popular catchphrase among Jehovah's Witnesses. They ran ahead of the organization. They read too much into it. And uh, that's why they fell into that trap of living for a date rather than living for Jehovah's organization. So um, what was interesting was, you know, that during my high school years, uh, I graduated 1985, but I really made the truth my own in the years that led up to my graduation from high school, which completely derailed my education. Um, and I know I'm fast forwarding through my childhood, and there's quite a bit to discuss there, and we've only got so much time. But um, you know, my, my education really was derailed because of the witness philosophy. And as a result, you know, I, I didn't go to college. Um, my guidance counselor came to me in 1985, right before I graduated. Actually, she came to me in 1984, 
which was the year I was baptized, February 4th, 1984. She came to me and said, well, you know, you've got such high grades and, you know, your mathematical scores are off the charts and, you know, you, you need to be, you know, in college. And I was in a school that uh, we studied engineering and science. And had I gone on to college, that last year in high school was a full year of college credit that I would have received had I gone on to three more years of college. I would have had the engineering degree. But there's no way that was going to happen because I was so indoctrinated. I, I really, truly, you know, I was a good witness. I believed what I was being told. I thought Bible prophecy was interesting. Um, I also knew that 1975, that date, had continued on past uh, 1975 in that, you know, you and I talked about this when, when you were writing your book, Reluctant Apostate, that 1975 never went away. What, what went away was just the idea that that was the date that the world was going to come to end, or, or you know, 6,000 years of human history was ending. It became and, like yeah. a ghost teaching, didn't it? That's the way I settled on referring yeah. to it. They, they came up with this explanation that we, it's not that the, the theology was wrong, it's just that we don't know the, the time span between Adam's creation and Eve's creation. And so that time span is the difference between essentially 1975 and the new system coming, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, and, that's And correct. that's basically a ghost teaching that has never been refuted in Watchtower literature. That's still technically what the explanation is. It is. And to this day, they still believe Adam was created in the year 4026. And that's never changed. Adam, uh, they still believe 1975 is the end of 6,000 years of mankind's existence, at least from the birth of Adam. And if they decided that if they knew when Eve was created, which might have been 10 years or 15 years after Adam, then, then we would know the date that the thousand-year reign of Christ would start, which also culminates with Armageddon. So there were all these teachings swirling around in my head. I thought it was very interesting. But then they took the world events that were going on at the time. For example, I'm in high school, and it was announced that 1986, I think, was going to be the International Year of Peace and Security. And so they were quoting scripture. The Watchtower came out with these scriptures from the Thessalonians. You know, whenever it is, they're saying peace and security, then sun destruction is to be instantly upon them. So, you know, we lived in this world of, uh, you know, imminent disaster that, you know, we had to be close to Jehovah's organization. So, um, you know, meanwhile, at that time, I was very close friends with uh, a guy by the name of John uh, Cheney, who is now a circuit overseer and a missionary over in Africa. And, you know, we were best friends and we were in each other's weddings. He was my best man. And, uh, you know, I had encouraged him to pioneer and go to Bethel. And he ended up doing that, coming out of Bethel after five years and then going on to um, going on to becoming a, you know, a missionary going to Gilead and then uh, ultimately he's a circuit overseer. So, um, you know, I affected his life. And when, when I left, I think it really, you know, devastated him uh, to the point where, um, you know, he, he had actually stayed with me after I had stopped going to meetings and the whole week he was here, you know, he just, and we're talking quite recently now, aren't we? Yeah, that actually yeah. was, you know, that was so uh, I came out in stopped going to meetings probably the end of 2013 and officially really officially ended in the beginning of 2014 because well we've leaped forward in the story now and yeah, I want to yeah, kind of build up to a bit more so, so you, 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 you basically you basically bailed on on a higher education because you were so committed to your beliefs yeah, that was, you know, looking back on it, it's really upsetting to me because I enjoyed my education. I enjoyed studying science and math. And, you know, I, wish, I really wish I had, you know, taken other classes, but we weren't allowed to take extracurricular classes. Um, matter of fact, I, I was just looking back on some things we, you know, I think while I was in high school, we we had the school and Jehovah's Witnesses you, you, brochure. You just triggered half of my audience at this point. Thank you. Mark. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, you know, I haven't read this in years, and it's really disturbing when I think about. Oh my God! You know, everything that we were told that we couldn't couldn't do. 
Um, and and it, there's a whole thing on the flag salute in here. And, and I'll tell you that um, I have a vivid memory of that when I was, I think it was in kindergarten. I remember just innocently coming home and maybe saying something to my mother that, uh, oh, we, you know, we had a flag salute today. And and that just unleashed the fury of, uh, you know, of hell. <laughs> and that rained down pretty hard upon me. So, you know, my parents had to go in and explain that uh, I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And because I participated, I, I really wanted to get along with my peers. And as it turns out, I think I was, you know, suffering from some form of autism at the time. And, you know, and I was very high functioning, but I don't feel like I was really, I was very much an outcast because of the religion. I, I couldn't participate in, I, first of all, I couldn't salute the flag. And that had to be pounded into me. And so my whole life, I had to explain year after year after year, I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses, I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, and they invite me to birthday parties, or we have school functions, and all the stories you've heard about, about children sitting outside of the classroom, or not participating in Valentine's Day, or not going to the Halloween party, or not dressing up, or not even, ex you know, I wasn't even allowed to accept the card. I had, you know, girls giving me cards, and it was like, no, you, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't give. You can't receive. That's participating. I'm sure you still Something. have girls giving you cards, but <laughs> um, just going on to this kind of crossroads in your life, you make yeah. this decision to commit yourself to the religion. Um, right. Talk us through sort of your youth uh, as as a Jehovah's Witness and what sort of stuff you got involved in. Because I know you travelled a lot, didn't you? Yeah. So, well, you know, in the high school years, obviously, that's when I became most committed to the faith, uh, because I obviously had to make a decision. Um, that really kind of ruined my education, because I was spending so much time reading and studying my watchtower and going back to the meeting and giving all the comments and giving all the talks, I gave every fill in talk I could give, you know, I really was wanted to be involved in it. Um, but I was baptized February 1984. I was in 11th grade, so I had one year to go. So all attention was on the organization. Almost none was on my education, even though I enjoyed my classes, you know, uh, structural and civil, civil and electrical and thermodynamics and all these engineering courses that were just absolutely fascinating to me. I had to give all that up and walk away from it. So when I did that, I had to make a choice, you know, was I going to be able to go into full-time service, uh, go to Bethel? Um, and that was very difficult for me because uh, I, I didn't have any money. You know, my, my parents put food on the table. I didn't really appreciate that. My mother didn't work, but my father worked uh, for the state of Maryland. And um, it was his only job he ever had his entire life. He worked there more than 30 years got a citation from the governor of Maryland for his loyalty and service to the to the state. So that's all I ever knew was that stability, but as a Jehovah's Witness. And ultimately, I decided that I wanted to do two things. One, I loved bicycles and mechanical things. I could take everything apart and put it back together. So I parlayed that into a job at a bicycle shop. And then I started repairing, you know, thousands of bicycles and Bicycle shop work is seasonal, um, although, you know, I did work out throughout some winters, but I worked as a bicycle mechanic and then as a salesperson um, while being a mechanic and ultimately um, took the money that I was earning working late at night, building bicycles and things until two o'clock in the morning. And I parlayed that into travel and I ended up traveling around the world um, in 1986, you know, a year after I graduated, I took my first trip to Israel and I, I spent over a month there, uh, two weeks with a group of witnesses and an ex-missionary. And then the, the next two weeks by myself, you know, as a, you know, like a 19 year old kid. Were you particularly around. interested in Israel due to, for, for religious reasons was the, yeah. The, an interest in validating what you were It learning. was. That's a very good question because, you know, first of all, I was encouraged to go over there by this small group of, uh, you know, faithful JWs from Maryland. So I thought, well, this will bolster my faith. You know, this will really, this will really make the Bible come alive, seeing the Bible ends. And I did. I mean, I've traveled to dozens and dozens of cities all over Israel from Dan to Beersheba, you know, all up and down the East Coast, down to Eilat, uh, even going down into Egypt for several days. 
Um, but then what happened was three years later, I loved it so much that I went back with the University of Maryland, which was really an aberration. The elders didn't want me to go, but I was invited to go with the university on an archaeological expedition in Caesarea. Caesarea is the place that's most famously known for they found the tablet, which mentions Pontius Pilate back around 1961 or so. They mentioned the tablet mentioned Pontius Pilate. It was found in the Roman theater. And that is something that Jehovah's Witnesses use to uh, establish proof or faith in the Bible. The Bible mentions Pontius Pilate. Previously, it wasn't mentioned in history. Now they found this tablet in the 60s. Therefore, the Bible is an accurate book of history. So that was the logic that I was given at the time. So I went over there with the idea that I was going to bolster my faith. And, you know, just, you know, I went over with multiple archaeologists and we worked from, you know, four o'clock in the morning until two or three in the afternoon. And then weekends, we traveled all over the country to a different, you know, to Tiberias, Sea of Galilee, Dead Sea, you know, Jerusalem, Siloam's tunnel, walked through Hezekiah's tunnel several times. And all of that was really, I thought, faith strengthening to me. But when I started interviewing and asking questions of the archaeologist to establish my faith in the Bible, I wasn't getting the answers that I expected. I wasn't getting the answers like, well, yeah, this, you know, this happened here and, and this proves what the Bible says. They were more analytical and scientific in their approach. And the majority of them, you know, were were there not as biblical scholars at all, but they were there to find out the history of this city, the facts of the city. And that, you know, I, I came back, you know, a little bit disappointed in that, although I gave 40 or 50 slide presentations on Israel and I mentioned the Pontius Pilate thing, but it didn't give me what I wanted in terms of building my faith as a Jehovah's Witness. You were expecting the ar archaeologists to vindicate everything you learned about the Bible, and that's not what they were doing. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, you know, I filed that away in my memory bank, and I continued traveling. Um, in 1987, I, uh, another JW buddy of mine, uh, drove across the United States for a month, and then we went to Hawaii and uh, the Fiji Islands and Australia, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Cairns, went diving on the Great Barrier Reef, went to New Zealand, went back to Australia, Tahiti, and flew back to the United States, drove back across the US and ended up, I was away for six months and it was really an epic journey. We visited branches all over the world. And that part I really felt was faith strengthening to me because we were a universal organization that you could go and visit any JW anywhere and we were all, universally accepting of each other. And that kept me in the organization for a long time. But something very interesting happened. While I was in Melbourne, Australia, there was a guy there by the name of uh, Kim Summers, a ministerial servant and his wife, and he was a collector of Watchtower publications. And by the way, during my teenage years, I was I was a collector of publications, you know, I've got... I should just say, oh. I've I've been to Mark's house, for the benefit of the viewers. I've <laughs> been to Mark's house, and if I had to say which of us has got the most extensive Watchtower collection, I think I'd hand it to Mark. Um, there's some items I've got that he hasn't got, and there's some items, uh, and vice versa, but you've got a massive collection. I, I'd have to give it to you for the sh the shortest path to a large collection True, of yeah. publications. So well done, Lloyd. Mm -hmm. uh, but what was interesting was that, um, you know, the, the elders were not really happy with me collecting the Watchtower Society's publications. And I found that interesting because why would they, this is our history. Charles Russell was the founder of the Bible Students Movement and, and Rutherford was first president in 1931. He named us Jehovah's Witnesses and it's all part of theocratic history, but they were not interested at all in me studying or collecting this information. And I, I know why now, because, you know, what's contained in that is, is just pure nonsense. And I didn't realize it at the time, but this gentleman I stayed with in Australia, he had a massive collection, bigger than any other collection in Australia and most collections in the US. Turns out he had been reading uh, Crisis of Conscience and other books. And he started giving me information that 
you know, I didn't know about crisis of conscience at the time. He just told me that Ray Franz wrote a book. And he also told me that he was in communication with this guy over in, I think, Sweden, uh, Carl Olaf Johnson, who was writing this book called The Gentile Times Reconsidered. And he said, you know, 607 is not the destruction of Jerusalem, as witnesses teach. And I said, well, well, you know, what do you mean? He explains that someone had written a treatise proving just the opposite, that it was not that date. And um, I remember arguing with him, you know, at, at his kitchen table beginning in 1988, saying, well, Kim, look, you know, even if the date's wrong, we still have the evidence that from 1914 onward, we have great wars and that fulfills Bible prophecy, that there would be reports of wars and earthquakes and pestilence. So you have to accept that as dual lines of evidence. So that was my thinking at the time. I was defending the organization and, you know, uh, after I left about five years ago, exactly five years ago, uh, I later reconnected with Kim Summers and I, you know, I apologized to him. And I also thanked him, you know, because he planted that seed that told me that there was life outside of Watchtower. There was information that I needed to know that was being concealed from me. I mean, for example, he had all of the elders books and I actually read them back in 87, 88. And I, you know, I remember thinking why, you know, why this is just, this is not secretive. Why, why would this be kept from the, you know, men and women in the organization? Yeah, indeed. It, it's, it's interesting. I remember having a similar conversation, I think on camera with my friend PC Ike, when we went to watch our headquarters, he brought up the fact that there's this massive difference between Bible students and Jehovah's witnesses in that they cherish their history and take pride in knowing what was taught and what the old publications have to say whereas for witnesses it's the opposite they're happy to put them in glass cases at the museum at, at warwick but when it comes to actually knowing what was written it's almost like you're encouraged to go nowhere near it um, it's almost it's almost apostate and um, that's how it's kind of considered. So. It really is. Um, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because I was just recently reading um, Mormons, uh, information about Mormons, and I think it's called the CES letter that was famously written, Yeah. Um, you know, to uh, leaders in the Mormon church. And it had this, you know, it that was, was it like a crisis of conscience, wasn't it? In a yeah, way. it was. Yeah. And it also reminds me of that list that you made when you were first coming out of the organization, you had a list of grievances. Mm and things that uh, were really bothering you, which were very well, you know, founded grievances. And um, so, um, yeah, I don't even know how, how I got on the subject. <laughs> um, but, you know, there were things that were really bugging me about the organization, but I didn't do anything about it. And the way I can explain this best, I came out when I was 46 years of age, and that was five years ago. The best way I can explain it is that, um, first of all, I love my witness friends, and I had an inertia to my life that kept me going because there were many good things about my life. I'm not an embittered XJW. I don't hate my witness friends. I had a good time. I mean, I traveled around the world. I went all over the Caribbean. One of the, the greatest things I think I did as a witness was engage in the building of kingdom halls which I liked because I was very mechanically inclined. And also I had a lot of electronics knowledge and engineering knowledge. So I put that together and I was designing sound systems for all of our local kingdom halls uh, before, during, and after I was ministerial servant. And we'll get to that, but um, I, I really took a lot of pride in that. And the fact that they relied on me to do that. And every time there was a problem, I'd get that phone call and I'd go to that kingdom hall when there was a lightning strike and it took out the amplifiers or it took out the equalizer or whatever. Um, I would be down there fixing it all volunteer. Of course, there was never any money involved, but, but we had a camaraderie because we traveled to the Turks and Caicos islands. We traveled to Antigua. Uh, we traveled to Costa Rica, built a kingdom hall. Uh, to St. Kitts and all these places where we um, had this bonding experience with our brothers that th these were really good times. And it was all it was all for a false purpose, but they were still good people. They were my You're friends. You were able to salvage the, the nice memories from, from those yeah. times. And yeah, I, 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 just for the benefits of viewers, um, because we've been working together for a few years now and 
um i just want to kind of highlight what you were saying about having having amicable feelings towards jehovah's witnesses and mark really does and in fact that's one of the things that drew me to work with you in the first place is that you are the opposite of what of watchtower stereotype of an embittered former former member and i'll never forget going visiting london bethel as part of the filming for the truth about the truth documentary with you and the the idea was that we were your we were your friends and you wanted to show them the the local bethel and you were so convincing as a Jehovah's Witness that uh, there were times even I was falling for it, <laughs> but you <laughs> couldn't pull that off unless you really, you, you still had warm feelings towards people in trapped inside that religion. And, and I think that there's a, a lot to be said for that. Yeah, you know, that's funny, Lloyd, you mentioned that because I've had that experience very recently. Um, right after I came back from the Montana trial, you know, within a week or so. Um, for those that haven't heard about it, you know, there was a 20, uh, $35 million judgment against Watchtower in a child abuse trial. So I came back, we did some filming for a documentary, and then immediately I found out about an event in New York. And this was the 75th anniversary, you know, this month or last month of the famous flag salute case of Barnett versus uh, West Virginia versus Barnett. And Are that's really where- telling this story? Cause this is, this is hilarious. <laughs> Are you really going to tell that story? Yeah. Well, I'm not going to play the audio from no, this. Don't play the audio, yeah. No, no. Um, but what happened was I decided to go to this event because it was held at the Robert H. Jackson center, which is a, uh, it's in Jamestown, New York, and it's a large building. It's a large house. That's a museum dedicated to the Supreme Court Justice who wrote the opinion of Barnett that allowed Jehovah's Witnesses to not salute the flag or not be required by school officials to salute the flag. And that was a good decision because it actually did help all of us citizens of the United States and then later of others because other Supreme Court decisions in other countries followed. So one of the reasons I went to that event was that not only do I enjoy history about the witnesses and in general, but uh, there were some keynote speakers that were going to be there, including Philip Brumley, who is the, the head legal counsel for Watchtower. And uh, Philip Brumley gave a speech uh, called uh, Canaries in the Coal Mine of Human Rights. And it was a play on, you know, canaries in West Virginia, because that's where this all took place. And the fact that Jehovah's Witnesses were the benchmark for human rights. So it was a propaganda speech about how much Jehovah's Witnesses have benefited the world. And that one decision did benefit uh, people. But of course, that decision would have been made regardless of Jehovah's Witnesses existence or not, because we wouldn't have gone 75 years with the flag salute being required of citizens. It just wouldn't, you know, some other group would have brought that up. But uh, moments after Brumley gave the keynote address, I approached him. And, and actually, the reason I bring this up was that, you know, there was maybe 300 people in attendance. I think it's a great oh, story oh. to show how how effortlessly you're able to blend in at those sorts of events, just like yeah. <laughs> simply by being nice and simply by not grabbing yeah. any opportunity to be nasty and confrontational with with worshippers. You were able to, if you'll allow me to cut to the chase, sure, you were able sure. to have a lengthy conversation with Watchtower's head legal counsel in which he was stupid enough to give you inside details on what their strategy would be in appealing the Montana case. Yeah, that's correct. And leading up to, leading up to that, <clears throat> when I walked in the building, I was greeted by all of these people. Some were from, from the uh, Jackson Center, but I was immediately recognized. And I thought, oh, no, I've been on YouTube couple dozen times, mm. you know, I'm writing for survey, they've seen my picture, I've, I've been at a protest in Reading, Pennsylvania, uh, that was filmed and documented by WGAL Lancaster. So all this was going through my mind. And I'm like, they're going to kick me out of here and tell me, you know, that I've my position has been revoked, my admittance has been revoked. But no, uh, a, a brother, an elder came up to me and he said, I know you, I know you, you're M Mark, right? And, 
And I said, yeah. And he said, he gave me a big hug. He called his wife over, you know, who was a girl I knew for many years. We hung out back when we Had were she sent you cards? in our 20s. But pardon? Had she sent you any cards at any point? <laughs> she sent me cards. Uh, look, I, you know, I, I worked in this whole RBC quick build environment, and that was a great way to get to know sisters. And, and ultimately, <laughs> okay. that's how I met my wife, Kimmy. Anyway, the elder comes up to you. Yeah, so he comes up to me and he's like, you know, welcoming me and I get big hugs. And I was, it was like going back in time, like I'm back as a Jehovah's Witness again, because the place was filled with Jehovah's Witnesses. And then he introduced, and he works for the Office of Public Information for Watchtower. And he introduces me to all these other OPI guys. And then ultimately, I've already met Phil Brumley. I've been in his office. But then after he gave his keynote speech, I went up to him and talked about Montana. And, you know, the only thing I'm going to say about that, because it's kind of a, you know, we're kind of getting derailed. But the only thing I'll say about that is, yes, I blended in like, you know, mm. I was a witness again. And these are nice people. They're just they're just misled, deluded, like we all were. Mm. And I think it's important for us to recognize, you know, there are people that have a lot of anger issues about Watchtower, rightly so, rightly so. But I I can't direct that anger against anyone but the, the leadership because these people are just like me. I was in for more than four decades, just yeah. like you. You were a believer. You wanted to see your mom again in the resurrection. You truly believed, and that's why you wanted to be an elder and help people. And I felt the same way. When so, I see a Jehovah's Witness today, I see myself, basically. And that's, I think, how we should all see ourselves, you mm -hmm. know, despite what we've been through. And, you know, sadly, some have been through some tragic things, and I understand their feelings, and I I can't, uh, you know, I can't hold back any, uh, you know, grudges that for their feelings the way that they feel. But the way I feel is that we need to help them. Mm -hmm. And um, so anyway, ultimately, it turned out really well. I filmed the event, and uh, Brumley and said we got to, some insights into the Montana case. Which... Well, he did. He, you know, he told me that uh, I was shocked. He told me that the elders have neither the right in Thompson Falls had neither the right nor the duty to report. And I said, so you're telling me that uh, clergy privilege applies in that case? And he said, absolutely. And he said that the judge, <laughs> he said the judge uh, broke the law in that case. And I thought, my God, after everything that happened in that case, for him to say that the judge broke the law by taking mm -hmm. away clergy privilege from those elders. In fact, he compared it to the Catholic Church. He said the Catholics, you know, have one priest and they have priest penitent privilege. We have three priests, meaning the judicial committee. But he fails to take into account the fact that these things. The, the, if you have multiple people talking among themselves, it's no longer a confessional, is it? You have the rest of the body of elders, and you have the service department, you have the legal department. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, that's a, that's a so, discussion for another day. Getting back onto your your life story, you're you're traveling around the world. You're having these yeah. interesting conversations with with people who are opening your mind, shall we say, to different possibilities, whether it's the archaeologist that you spoke to or whether it's the guy who uh, puts you on to the existence of Ray Franz and Carl yeah. Olaf Janssen. Uh, take us through to becoming a ministerial servant. Yeah, so I, um, I consider myself a late bloomer. Um, I saw all my friends getting ma either married or disfellowshipped. So either they couldn't hold it any longer and they had sex and, and it was discovered, they got disfellowshipped, you know, for that and other reasons, or they remained faithful like my buddy John, you know, he and I were best friends, we kind of bolstered each other's faith, he went on to be a Bethelite. During that time, I was visiting Brooklyn Bethel, you know, I lived three hours from Brooklyn, so I was back and forth, I was staying in all the Bethel rooms, you know, uh, with or without permission, because he would sneak me in there all the time. And I got to see a lot of the inside of the organization. And I'll mention one thing later about that. Remind me to mention what happened back in uh, around 1986 or seven when I went to Brooklyn, because it played a significant role in the Australian Royal Commission. But um, I, I think it was, I became a ministerial servant around 1993. So it, it took years for me, because I just wasn't interested in a position. I, I just, I mean, I, I wanted to help, um, 
but I was always criticized for being a thinker. You know, stop researching so much. Make sure you read from our publications. I remember raising my hand and reading a scripture from the Today's English Version Bible during a Watchtower comment, and the elders sat me down and said, you, you, you got to be careful not to do that and not to say you read scriptures from other translations of the Bible as if the New World Translation is, is not the uh, approved and authorized version of the Bible that we should be quoting from. And, and that just happened over and over again. And years earlier, and there were a lot of things that the elders did that bothered me. And um, I didn't leave because of the elders. I didn't leave because I was disgruntled with any you know, one person that did something to me. That wasn't the case, but it was a, a combination of a lot of things. For example, when I was around what, what, eleven or what were you doing? Well, I'm 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 just trying to build a picture of yeah. So what were you doing as a? Because I, I I'm fascinated in how it all kind of began to unravel. Okay, but I'm also interested in what what you were doing as a ministerial servant. So what? You kind yeah, of well, me. right. That's a story in itself. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, uh, so I was appointed, like I say, around 1993, and the the elder finally said, "Well, we have no reason not to appoint him." I'd never been in, tr- I'd never been in trouble for anything. I wasn't going. That's to not the elder. most glowing of endorsements, is it? <laughs> not, well, no, it's it's not. It's because I they yeah. they wanted they wanted you to go and grovel. They wanted you to yeah. go and say to them, "I want to reach out, brother. What can I do to reach out?" And I thought that was bogus. I I, I just. I despise that. You know, I, I wanted it to happen organically. If the congregation respected me and wanted to appoint me as a servant and then as an elder, fine, I'll, I'll help the congregation. But I didn't want to campaign. And I saw all these guys around me who were campaigning to become an elder. And they kept going to the elders. What can I do to reach out? Or when can you make my recommendation? It's like, what you know, that's so self absorbed it's so self-aggrandizing i thought that's that's not genuine and authentic and that's why it took me so long to become a servant or even be accepted because i just didn't want it that badly so finally in 93 they approached me i didn't know if they were going to do it they approached me at the beginning of a meeting and said you know mark is there any reason why you should not be appointed uh as a ministerial servant you know that's a typical question they ask and they asked you as well and I said no, and they said, okay, then we're going to announce you tonight. And so I was announced as a ministerial servant. So this was five years before I got married. So I had spent that five years, uh, you know, previously I had auxiliary pioneered, but then I began building my business. After the bike shop, I built a business in the fitness industry, and it was very successful. I had a lot of JWs working for me. And, um, you know, that's a, a difficulty in itself, of course, uh, which has created difficulties when I left the organization. But I... So what roles did you have as a servant? Um, right. So obviously, the, the, the first thing they gave me was a lot of speaking, speaking assignments. You know, you start off with the announcements and uh, they gave me uh, Bible highlights. I gave a lot of those, which ended up being very interesting because... An elder who had moved out of the area and came back didn't like the fact that servants were giving Bible highlights talk and talks, and he fought. They, the elders were fighting among themselves as to which servants were qualified to give Bible highlights and also to give public talks outside of the organization, so or outside of the lo- yeah. local congregation. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I was giving public talks a good bit, and then I was invited to give pu- public talks outside of my local area. So I gave, you know, some in uh, Pennsylvania, some in Maryland, and uh, I was obviously very involved in the operating of sound, you know, running the sound equipment and RBC and installing and managing, you know, uh, aspects of the sound department. Um, but um, you know, I just never had that uh, desire to be an elder, although they were really trying hard to get me appointed as an elder. I was going on shepherding calls, which I thought was very weird. Like, for example, we would be out in service and they would try to stalk someone who they were looking for. Or, and this happened all the time, you know, they were trying to track down either an inactive person or somebody who had done something and they, they were trying to corner them so they could question them. And I thought, that's, that's not me. That, that's just, I, I don't know that I could do that to, to stalk someone. And they, you know, they would camp out, camp out and try to wait for somebody to go into someone else's house 
you know, to prove that they're committing fornication. Those kind of things were just like kind of lodged in the back of my mind. Like that's, that's not who I was, but I spent, you know, probably the first five years of being a ministerial servant as, you know, being given all these assignments and talks. And then the last five years, it was going downhill because right. something was just not right. Yeah. So you were, you were exposed to some extent to the, the mundanity and the corruption to, for want of a better word of, you know, of how things yeah. are run in a congregation. And, and I know that's one of the most interesting things from when you were telling me your story um, when we first met about you were basically on the receiving end of a lot of criticism and unlike you mentioned there backbiting and and basically politics that yeah. uh, basically undermined you into any enthusiasm you might have to to do more in the organization would that be fair it's fair to say, and I don't criticize anyone, including yourself, for becoming an elder because each elder body and each congregation is different. If the circuit of, one of the circuit officers came to me and said, "This is after I was deleted," and he came to he came to me and said, "I don't know what they have against you. He's you know you're not doing anything wrong." Uh, he said, "You ought you know." Several of them told me, "You just go to a different congregation." And mm. lots of ministerial servants uh, had left Perry Hall, which is my congregation, and had gone to other congregations were appointed as elders because they wouldn't appoint them in our congregation. It, it was just uh, all personality based, and I knew that, mm. and I knew that. But it all came to a head uh, one day, and I think it was back in, um, you know, it was wow. Well, um, was it 2008? I actually have a letter here. So it all came to a head when I was assigned to give a public talk in yeah, 2003. I was assigned to give a public talk in my congregation one Sunday. And uh, about three or four days before that talk, I got a call from an elder in another congregation. And he said, could you give a talk in our congregation? We have a, a sub, we need a substitute this Sunday. And I said, well, I, I can't do that because I'm already scheduled to give a talk here in Perry Hall congregation. And so he said to me, uh, oh, no, no, it, it's okay because your meeting's at nine o'clock, our meeting's at 1230. You could just come right over and give the same talk. And I said, well, you know, if it's if it's approved, fine, but, uh, you know, just make sure it's approved. And he said, okay. And he calls me back and says, yeah, it's approved. No problem. Come give the talk. And I said, okay. So about uh, 1130, close to midnight, Saturday night before my talk, which I'm, I'm still finishing working on my talk, get a phone call from our local presiding overseer at the time, who's now still the coordinator. This is a guy who's exactly my age. Um, we were, you know, I was in his wedding. We were close friends. We traveled all over the place together from Costa Rica to Colorado. And he calls me up and says, you can't give that talk over in Dundalk congregation. And I said, what do you, what do you mean I can't give the talk? And he says, you know, I didn't approve it. And I said, well, well, what do you, what do you mean you didn't approve it? I, you know, you told me, you know, they, the elders there told me that it was approved. And he said, they didn't run it by me. And uh, anyway, uh, I was, just, I had just had it. Mm. Actually, that was the beginning of the end. I had just absolutely had it. Here I was working close to midnight, trying to finish this talk. I agreed to give a second talk that I didn't really want to give. And I just, I was. And it's draining it. work giving these talks, isn't it? It's very draining. It's Very not dry. like you're like the local, the, the wannabe celebrity who's like, yeah, just well, wants it, exposure on the platform. It, it's, it's, yeah, it's, you are giving of yourself when you do it, you know? It, it's very, and, and at the time they were, you know, the full 45 minute talks, yes, they were yeah. 30 minutes. And, and the other thing, you know, looking back on it is giving a talk on something that's absolute nonsense, looking back on it is draining too. This yeah. talk was on the resurrection and I had given it before. But when you are trying to fit this information into a talk, present it to a congregation, but in the back of your mind, you know, something's not right, that drains you even more. It's, it's the cognitive dissonance. So anyway, I, I got so mad at him that I said, I cannot take this anymore. I slammed the phone down on the presiding overseer and I said, forget it. Bam, hung up the phone. He calls back. My wife answers, Kimmy, and, and she chews him out. And she's like, you can't do this to Mark. You know, he's worked hard on this talk and he was approved to give this other talk. And, you know, 
so anyway, um, she she has it out with him, and I I didn't sleep one hour that night, not even one hour. I was so it just stressed me out so bad. I thought, how can giving a public talk to try to help people and do it as a volunteer twice in one day, two public talks, how can that be so stressful? Something is not right. It just tore me to pieces. And uh, so anyway, he, he had, I, I don't know if he called back my wife and said, you know, okay, the talks can go on. You know, he backed down. I went and gave the talk on no sleep. Uh, in my congregation and then ran over to this other congregation on the east side and I gave that talk and that was the last talk I ever gave because two weeks two weeks later another elder came to me and said well we want to talk uh, to you about you hanging the phone up on Doug and I said well what do you what do you mean talk to me you know it's the way we want to talk to you about it so they bring me into the back room and all the elders were there including Doug, the guy, the presiding overseer, that was one of my best friends. And they said, oh, this is, this is not about, you know, hanging up the phone, but uh, we feel that you don't qualify as, uh, you know, ministerial servant anymore. You're, you're not being cooperative uh, with the elder body arrangement. And, you know, they were... Uh, it quite clearly was about hanging up the phone, though, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And for them, they were just like, well, he's not a team player. It's mm. what it was. He was. He's not a team player. So they said, well, so you can write an appeal. So I wrote an appeal. And in the appeal, I it was very, you know, you know, I'm a, I'm a writer, which was suppressed mm. when I was a kid, but now I'm writing everything. And, and it's difficult sometimes for me to write. So I wrote my feelings. And uh, presiding overseer Doug was, you know, he was hot because I had mentioned him in this letter that went to the branch. It went to the governing body mm. and, you know, whoever was the service department at Watchtower. He was furious. So, and so they wrote back and said, well, we're going to wait for the circuit overseer to come around. And the circuit overseer came around. And this is a man who was on his last leg. He was deleted as CEO immediately after the visit where he deleted me. And he just told me, I, you know, they're just telling me this. I don't know what else to do. We all have to speak in agreement. And, and a bunch of the elders didn't want me to be deleted. But they have this rule, as you know, as an elder body, you all have to speak in agreement. Mm. So because there was such, you know, two of the elders were so strongly opposed to be remaining as a servant, they all were pressured to make this yeah. decision. And, and I just, I was like, fine. All it and takes I, is one or two strong personalities on the body and everyone just has to fall in line. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Lloyd, that was the beginning of the end. You know, mm. in fact, I've never read this letter, you know, I've. I might read it for a documentary we're doing. So I got a letter back from the Christian Congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm sure it's, I've never even read it. It just bothered me so much. I just pulled it out of the envelope, but I've literally not read it at all. And Mm. I'm sure it just says, you know, we encourage you to re-qualify, but I was done. And that was the beginning of the end. So I I buried myself in my RBC work. I, uh, you know, I did everything I could to build the kingdom halls and and do that instead of try to bury myself in congregation work. Um, I, from 2008 to 2009, I spent a year as uh, building the sound system for an assembly hall here in Maryland. And I was a site photographer and I, uh, I took, uh, I took pictures like uh, I was the aerial photographer for the, um, for the mm-hmm. assembly hall project. I, I took a lot of pride and joy in doing those kind of things. But as far as the politics of the organization, I was done. And then five years ago today, I told my wife, no more. Take take me up to the point when you emailed me, if you can. Yeah, so uh, I, had, I had told my wife that, you know, November 2013, obviously, but I still had a couple oh, so of things. That... Your conversation with your wife was before you emailed me, was it? That's right. Yeah, it was. And, and yeah. just to explain to the viewers, the reason why we're doing this interview now is because as we do this, it's the 27th of November 2018. And we're talking about something that happened exactly five years ago, almost on the 28th. We're going to try and upload this on the 28th of November right. 2018. Um, because it's the anniversary. So maybe in that case, if we go back to that conversation that you had with your wife. We were about to go on vacation uh, to visit an elder and his wife that I was very close with, particularly the wife had been her friend for 20 some years. And 
um, she had gotten married to a guy named um, Judah, and uh, he was an elder. And uh, ironically, he, you know, he's a child abuse victim. And, um, you know, that was never handled. And uh, so anyhow, um, we were uh, one hour from leaving to go to Pennsylvania. It was a Thursday. We were going to spend the whole weekend up there with them, go see a movie, go in field service. And uh, we were one hour from going away. And Kimmy says to me, um, should I pack your suit for uh, going in field service Saturday? And I, I just, you know, something snapped in my mind, not in an angry way or anything, but just something snapped. And I just calmly walked up to her office and I said, you know, I sat down, I said, I can't do this anymore. I'm done. And she's like, what, what, what do you mean? I said, I'm done. I'm done. Meetings, service, all of it. I just, it's, it's not, I just can't do that anymore. And you know, she asked me why. And I, I to be honest, I, I really hadn't formulated exactly why. I just knew that it was wrong. I just knew that I did not belong here anymore. And one of the things I told her was, I said, my brain is turning to mashed potatoes. And, and, I, and she remembers looking back on that. And by the way, she was devastated. She remembers looking back on that as you know, here I was during the meeting, instead of listening to the, the ridiculous drone, droning talks, I would actually just read the Bible because I found reading scriptures from Judges or Chronicles and history much more interesting than the repetitive nonsense that was going on at the meetings. And, and I tried to explain to my, my wife, Kimmy, that I saw you know four decades of things over and over and over again nothing's changed the end's not coming it never will it's it's all bs it's all untrue and the best way i could explain it to her was just to tell her that my brain my brain was just being mashed into jello and she was devastated we still went on the trip we left an hour later i had a good time inside she was torn to pieces because my wife was like you know, like I was, she was, you know, born in the organization. Um, she had been a pioneer for many, many years. When we got married, we were the pioneer ministerial power couple up and coming um, family she lived with, wanted her to become a missionary. And she had all these aspirations and it, her whole world collapsed when I told her we were, that I was done because all she could see was, I'm going to lose all my friends. You know, we, we went on vacations every year to Myrtle Beach, Carolina. We went skiing in Colorado and Maine and Vermont. And I've got friends all over the world. And we just did so much as, uh, you know, as a couple in the organization. And I, and I love these people. But I, ha I had to make that decision to cut it off at 46 years of age. And it was the most difficult thing I've ever done was to pull the plug on being one of Jehovah's Witnesses because that was my life and it was done and it affected other people. It affected my parents, it, you know, who are, you know, have been witnesses since, you know, for 51 years, it affected my wife's entire life. And I felt bad about that. And that, that's how, kind of how I remember it is you emailing me. Um, yeah, it was a couple of months later. Basically at a, at a crossroads where you were, you were wondering how on earth you could, rebuild your life basically that seems that, to be yeah and i very much you know want to appreciate um you know it's funny how it comes full circle because a few months after and by the way i i went and still finished up a few assignments because i mm -hmm. i was done with the meetings but two months later i had still gone in and i finished uh building a sound system at the mount washington kingdom Hall in baltimore maryland which is a brand new little hall and i took pictures and i knew at that moment this is the last time i would ever set foot inside of the kingdom hall as a Jehovah's witness, unless it was for a funeral. But I mean, I was done and I took a few mm -hmm. pictures, saved it on my phone, done. And, um, but I, I had not been reading apostate material. I wanna emphasize that as a witness up to the time I left and even months after I was not reading apostate material like crisis of conscience. Mm -hmm. I, I knew about it, but I, I, I was too afraid to read that. And I, you know, I thought it was, you know, evil apostates, angry people that wrote this bitter nonsense and untruth. And that's all wrong, of course, but that's the mental conditioning that I had. So a few months later, I was perusing the internet. I finally gave myself permission to look up some things on the internet. I did two things. Number one, I, 
I went on Amazon. I had a Kindle, big garden in the backyard. I was reading a lot. And I read a book called Journey to God's House by Brock Talon. Uh, I read that because it was all about Brooklyn Bethel at the same time that I was going back and forth to Brooklyn Bethel. So everything he said in that book was 100% af- accurate, all about like Mr. Coffee, the apostate and, and the hanger guy. All of that is completely accurate. I read that. And then I got a hold of a copy of Crisis of Conscience. And I read that. And I thought, Ray Franz is the real deal. This guy is genuine. Everything in that book he said was accurate. He had proof, documents, letters. It jived with everything that I knew to be correct. And he wasn't bitter and angry. He was, he was literally acting upon his conscience. So at that point, of course, I felt like I needed some sort of support structure because I was an island. I was alone. I came out on my own. I felt like I needed some help. And I didn't have Facebook. I've, I'd never had Facebook. So I found your videos, uh, a couple, I think a couple of your videos and JW survey. So I thought of all the people out there, uh, you know, you know, there were, there were some people that were just saying crazy things. They were, you know, talking about subliminal imagery in the organization, just, just nonsense, you know, stuff that I knew was not true. But when I got to your channel, I thought, you know, this guy's, this guy's the real deal. He's, he's genuine, he's honest, and he's telling, you know, He's telling the truth, and I think he's helping a lot of people. So I wrote to you, and um, <laughs> I wrote a medium-length email. You wrote me back right away, which, as it turns out later, you and I talked about it. That was surprising because you, you were getting so many emails mm. at the time that you were kind of unable to. Yeah. So which you did still a couple the case, of but I, I think you. every now and then I get an email where I just glance at it, and it's like I'm glancing at myself, and um especially I, maybe it was the the length of your email was a bit more manageable i don't know what it was but i just was able to reply to it and uh yeah and, and that was very helpful to me because it showed that you were you know genuine enough to respond and take time out of your schedule to respond to that email and uh you recommended a couple of things you recommended the facebook uh recovery group 3 and at the time that was still going and uh had a lot of xgws in it and what I was looking for was some kind of validation because I was an island by myself. And then when I joined that recovery group that you had recommended, suddenly I realized, oh, my God, everyone is having these the same stories and experiences that I had as a kid. And it, it really helped validate, and make me feel better that I was part of a community of people who understood what I was going through. And so now we, we don't, the recovery group is not active right now, but there's a lot of other groups and probably the best one I think is the Reddit XJW group, mm. uh, almost 30,000 members now, you know, really genuine people, but you know, you responded to that <clears throat> and I really appreciated that you took the time to do that, which is why now I take the time to do that for yeah. JW. Survey. Now you're paying it forward because now if someone emails JW survey, usually you're not all, I mean, obviously we're, we're inundated and it's impossible. Yeah. All the time, but if you can, you, you usually reply on behalf of the team, which is just brilliant. So um, as I recall, things got to the point with JW survey where I couldn't handle it by myself anymore. And I needed to make a decision about, you know, letting more people yeah. in on it and handing over my baby <laughs> as it were. And, uh, I, I decided on you and COVID fade and I've never looked back from that decision. And from then, of course, we started doing the watch time focus episode. So, yeah. yeah. It was a real honor. Uh, I think JW survey, we try very hard to, bring the truth to the forefront without any sensationalism or conspiracy mm. theories, because we care about people. We, we want the truth to be out there. And if we make a mistake and we've made mistakes, we mm. put it out there and we admit it, we talk about it and we accept it. And um, so it's been an honor working with survey and uh, also with covert fade, you know, he's just a brilliant person. Um, you know, anybody that has ever met him knows what a genuine and, and true friend he is to everyone he's ever met. So, um, you know, I want to thank both of you for the opportunity, because one thing you don't have as a Jehovah's Witness is a voice. Your voice is the organization's voice. So by, you know, having the privilege of writing for survey or editing, 
uh, that gives me and others a voice that we didn't have before. And that's very liberating. And then the, the most liberating thing and the most, I think, important thing is when we get those emails back and, and Lord, we could talk eight hours on the emails we get back from JW Survey of the people whose videos you, you've you've changed their lives. And I, I'm not exaggerating when, when I say we get two or three a day. And some of them are the most gripping stories that mm-hmm. I've ever heard. And also in response to the survey articles. So, you know, it's my opportunity to thank you for putting together that site. And, um, you know, it's helped a lot of people and it helped me. Well, thank you. Um, I do have to drag you back to your story, though, because you asked me to remind you of yeah. a trip to Bethel in which you... Uh, obtain some information which would come in which would come in useful during yeah. the Australian Royal, Royal Commission. I've never really written much about this because this is not about me. Um, you know, this is something that is about uh, all victims of child abuse, and I, I didn't want to highlight I'm the guy that did this or I'm the guy mm. that did that. But I, I will tell the story briefly that. Mm. Uh, during the late 1980s, as I mentioned, I was traveling back and forth to Brooklyn and I was uh, going through all the tunnels and bridges and buildings that you can imagine because my friend was really proud of it. He loved to show me around everywhere. In fact, I've even stayed in a governing body member's room and I've you know, met many members of the you know, governing body helpers, uh, service department, just all, uh, you know, all sorts of head honcho people at Brooklyn, and they were all very nice to me. Um, you know, Carrie Barber, and in fact, it was interesting, I, I found this, I found this today, this was one of the governing body members, uh, C.W. Barber. Uh, <laughs> I met gave, Kerry Barber as well, actually, but he was it, not very um, aware at the time, he was, had his Zimmer frame, and he had his helpers around him, so probably didn't remember much of the experience but yeah he's quite a guy real dry humor he um yeah he had he was a circuit overseer in maryland among other yeah. places and he, there's a lot of interesting stories about kerry barber but as we know he's passed away and also uh sam heard back when he was still a circuit and district overseer mm. he served uh maryland sorry Recent, that's recently spoke. featured on leah remini's scientology in the aftermath <laughs> um but you you found a, a document yeah. Yeah. So uh, when I was going through, as most of you know, uh, Brooklyn had a lot of libraries, including the writing department library. I've been inside the inner sanctum of that writing department library, but there was also a Gilead library, which was off limits to most people, except I was brought in there by my friend and uh, spent an hour or two in there. And I picked a book off the shelf that was, it was blue. It was actually this color blue. And it was thick, and it was called Branch Organization. And I thought, and, you know, I was a collector at the time, had, you know, hundreds and hundreds of old books, and I collected everything, memorabilia, everything. And this book, I thought, I've never seen this before, Branch Organization. I started reading it, and I sat down with this book and went through it, and I thought, oh, my goodness, this, this is a book on how to run a branch office from the direction of the governing body how to manage the organization. If you open a branch in Mexico, here are the procedures. Here's what you need to do tax-wise and procedure-wise and judicially. And uh, it was the most secretive document I've ever seen. And um, so that was around 86 or so. And I lodged that in my brain. And um, what happened was in the year 2015, after I had left, so this is, you know, within two years of my leaving the organization, uh, came across the Australian Royal Commission while it was going on. I started watching it right from the beginning. And I started thinking, I, I saw these guys talking about the procedures and policies of the organization. And this, you know, we had this branch overseer of Australia and we had the head attorney of Australia and all these guys were lying about the organization. They were trying to protect the governing body, weren't they? And they were trying to imply that the watchtower in Australia gets to decide for itself what it's going to do. It's not necessarily directed by the right. body. Yeah. Because they had uh, they had found out that Jeffrey Jackson was in the country. He was in Australia. Yeah. And uh, so they were know, trying desperately to to avoid a scenario where right. Andrew Jackson would be called, because if they could, if they could lodge it in the commission's minds that the governing body had no relationship to the branch office, 
then there will be no no need to interview Jeffrey Jackson. Right. And they, they also wanted evidence that he was responsible. He was one of the seven men responsible for the policies on child abuse. If they could pin that on him, then they could subpoena him. Other than that, their attorneys kept standing up and saying, I remember on day five, they were saying, no, 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 uh, brother Jackson is just involved in translating matters. He has mm-hmm. no involvement in this. And I thought, you liars. Yeah. He is he is a governing body member who signs off on all policies, and he's a member of multiple committees. You know, I think it was the writing and chairman's committee. It was just multiple committees. And I thought, you you know, you're lying to keep him from getting subpoenaed. So what I did was a light bulb went off in my head, branch organization manual. And then secondly, I had a document that tied Jeffrey Jackson to three different committees, including the committee that published the elders manual. And what I did was I had managed to get a copy, uh, a PDF copy of that I didn't even know existed online, but I managed to get a copy of the branch organization manual from a few years before. And I drafted an email and the, the commission was going to end on, uh, I think it was day six. It was the last day that testimony was being given. And I had one shot at getting this information to Angus Stewart. And so I drafted an email and at the top of the the subject line, it said evidence for Royal Commission. And I I included a letter explaining how Jeffrey Jackson uh, was responsible for policy and decision-making in the organization, including child abuse policy. And then I included a copy of the branch organization manual, as well as a list of the committees that he was part of as a governing body member. And it was uh, one hour and eight minutes before the start of the commission. And what happened was, um, I didn't realize this, but I, you know, I didn't think he would even get it because, as I found out later, he was getting at least fifty emails per and day. He was talking about Angus Stewart. Sorry, Angus Stewart. I, yeah. I didn't even. Yeah, I sent it directly to Angus Stewart, but I, I didn't know if he was even going to bother reading it. And uh, turns out that I'm watching the Royal Commission final day. And he starts reading, he starts questioning, uh, I think, O'Brien, uh, you know, I'm sorry, it was actually, it wasn't O'Brien at that point. It was, it, it may have been Watch Terror's lead attorney, Vincent Toole, who I later spoke with, by the way, but that's another story. But he was questioning them on, uh, he's, you know, he asked them, does this document uh, branch organization exist? And uh, or is it true that the governing body meets every Wednesday in closed session? And is it true this and that? And he was asking questions as if he was reading them directly from my email, it just sent chills down my spine. I called my wife into the room. I said, you, I said Kimmy, you, you got to see this. He said, he's reading things that are coming right out of my email. And then I realized that behind him, he had a cart of information and he had printed out a copy of that. This is one hour before the start of the commission. He had printed out the branch organization manual. Suffice it to say, at the end of that day, he wrote uh, a short email back to me and he said, um, you know, thank you. At the time it was John Redwood. He said, thank you, John, uh, for everything you sent. If you had watched today's proceedings, you would have realized the impact that you had upon them. And I thought, oh my God. And, And within days, they had issued a subpoena for Jeffrey Jackson and Jackson appeared on the stand. So and then if later, he hadn't sent that email, we don't we we can't know for sure, but it's very likely that we would never have had Jeffrey Jackson. Giving well, according that. to yeah, I, I talked to Angus about it this year several times, and he actually wrote me back and he said that they would not have subpoenaed Jackson without those two, two right. pieces of evidence. So I might print those out and frame <laughs> frame them. <laughs> You but should. it just goes to, you yeah. know, I, I don't talk about this story because I don't really need to highlight what I did or what's, you know, uh, I want to I want to highlight the fact. I think that- it's important to talk about it because it shows that just by being vigilant and just by being yes. quick to share information, we can all make a difference. It doesn't have to be that making the point. YouTube videos. It doesn't have to be making blog articles. If you know something, share it and you just don't know what's going to come of it. One person can make a difference. One yeah. person just writing an email, sharing information. So yeah, that. Um, and I think a lot of people have come back later and said it was the testimony of Jackson that convinced them to finally leave the organization because they realized that what he was saying was this was not spirit directed. This was just organizational speak, and that he was evasive and 
And you know, the, I think the Bible said that you will speak before kings and governors, and yet they did everything in their power mm. to keep Jackson from testifying on that royal commission, everything until finally they got the evidence they needed and they subpoenaed him and that was it. So they're willing know, to, to do conventions about being courageous, but uh, it's a case of do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. Do um, I've so. got two more questions for you. Um, first being, because I, I, we've kind of taken a whistle stop tour through your life story, but one thing I don't think we've really covered and I'm mindful that you will, only want to share maybe a bit of this but this is your opportunity basically um maybe you could just describe the fallout in your personal life once you made the decision to not just stop attending meetings but also mm. to involve yourself in activism yeah yeah that was that was very difficult because i as I mentioned, I never had a Facebook account. I, w I really wasn't a social media person. It took a long time before I even opened an Instagram account because I, you know, I've always taken pictures. And so finally, uh, after I emailed you uh, and you recommended joining the Facebook recovery group, so I opened up uh, the John Redwood Facebook account and just solely so that I could research and be a part of that group and, you know, get some... Um, Therapy. validation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And some therapy, you know, that's online therapy. Yeah. Yeah. So um, in the course of doing that, though, I, um, you know, I was still very involved with people that worked for me. Um, you know, I had a number of JWs who worked for me at the time. And I also had uh, some tenants that were JWs. And I couldn't go public because of many reasons. Obviously, my income and business depended upon you know, JW is working for me and living, you know, on my property, as well as, um, you know, my parents obviously, you know, were crushed that I stopped going to meetings to begin with. And, you know, it's just, it's so difficult when, when you look back on it, you think, my God, this is crazy. Like, you know, you, anyone else could leave the Catholic church or some other, you know, mainstream religion and no problem. But, you, you know, you cannot gracefully leave Jehovah's Witnesses. It, it comes with a severe penalty. So I actually managed to keep my business going for several years um, while working undercover, um, you know, writing some articles and, and doing what I could, like with the 2015 Royal Commission. So um, it, it wasn't until it wasn't until I'd actually accidentally sent an email from my survey account instead of my regular Mark account to yeah, I remember that. Yeah. the guys that worked for me. And yeah. uh, so, you know, he was like, you know, who's JW survey. And so he started kind of figuring things out and he stayed a while and just ultimately just walked out. And um, eventually they all walked out and, you know, that was. Um, and what, what impact did that have on your business? Yeah. Well, obviously, um, you know, I, I was at the point where I really wanted to devote my time and energy to helping people. So I could have tried to rebuild the business with non JWs. Uh, but it's very difficult to do that and retrain people in the, the technical work that we do without being able to walk away from the activism. So I had to make a choice. And so, uh, you know, this is the short version of things. But you know, it, it devastated, obviously, my business, but I really don't care as much about money as I care about trying to help people. So, um, you know, so yeah, I, I, you know, eventually lost everything, but um, um, losing my friends and family, obviously, they, you know, I'm not reproved or disfellowship, never have been. Uh, they haven't come after me. I, I feel like they're afraid to uh, come after me. Um, I don't know. I mean, they, the elders really haven't tried to track me down or, you know, I think they know that I know too much. I mean, you know, a number of them are very corrupt and they probably know that I know things about them, but so yeah, it's been very difficult, but I try to focus on the positive Lloyd about, you know, the positive work that I can do with survey and with helping people and responding to their emails and uh, doing what I can with the investigations of child abuse those things to me are more important than my previous life. So, you know, we, we were, you know, my, my wife came out, by the way, I didn't really tell her story and she can tell it herself, but 
she woke up within a year of my leaving. And that was because I didn't throw apostate information at her. I didn't hit her with, hey, uh, you know, you need to read Crisis of Conscience. You know, it was very subtle. I answered her questions. She wanted to get in my head. Why was I leaving? Why did I do this? And eventually she understood. And she, too, is a victim of abuse that the elders never reported to the police. And she could have gotten help. And they never reported her, her own mother was her abuser. And they never reported that to the police or Child Protective Services or anyone. It was all handled internally. So that helped her wake up. And she found the Candace Conti case online and she thought, well, that's not apostate. That's just a court case. I can read that. So that actually led to her waking up, which so I can tell people that are asking, well, you know, how can I help my spouse, you know, that is still in the organization? Well, don't beat them over the head with, you know, don't don't go buy a copy of Crisis of Conscience and then bang them on the head with it. You know, that doesn't work. You, You need to be respectful, subtle kind, patient. And that's what happened to my wife, Kimmy, and she eventually did wake up. But yeah, it it had my leaving had a great impact on my life. Because it would have been much easier if I had left it at 19 or 20. You know, when I first found out that there was a Ray Franz out there, but never read anything. And we didn't have the internet back then in the 80s. So now we have all of these tools such as YouTube videos and the internet. And I just encourage people to take advantage of them and, you know, help uh, as many people as they can, but do it in a respectful, subtle and patient way. And will they come after me? You know, I I don't know. I mean, there's going to be an Atlantic article about my work coming up soon. Um, There's a documentary that I'm working on in addition to the one that uh, I'm working on with you, uh, which is very important. And uh, these things obviously are going to trigger some sort of reaction with people in my former congregation. But I will mention this. uh, We were contacted very recently by a sister in our congregation who, you know, was very respected JW sister married with multiple kids and she said, I'm done. And we were shocked. She reached out to my wife and, um, you know, we've talked to her and you just never know who's going to come out. Don't write anybody off because, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people thought I would never come out. I was a dedicated JW and I wasn't a guy out there reading apostate information, Mm -hmm. but don't write them off. Indeed. Um, Well, before I ask my final question, which you've all already sort of answered, but um, I just want to, again, thank you for the amazing work that you've put in over the last few years. I, I think you've really forged a reputation for, you know, going outside your comfort zone and and chasing some of these stories, you know, going to the Fessler case, going to the uh, Montana verdict and and being able to to basically report where no where no other reporters seem to be taking an interest you're there with your notepad taking down all the details and reporting back and it's a really really valuable service that you give to the xjw movement and i'll always be in awe of that so i guess my final question and again you've sort of answered it but what would be your message to any any john redwoods out there who are taking their first steps online who are curious as to whether they should indulge their doubts or not? Well, I guess the first thing I would say is that uh, you're not alone. Pardon me. You're not alone. There's a lot of people who are thinking exactly the thoughts that you're thinking. Sorry about that. I'm getting choked up. (laughs) There's a lot of people that are thinking what you're thinking, and I know it's difficult for you to express that because you have family, you have, and I don't mean you, I mean, you know, everybody out there who's trapped inside the organization. Um, You might be struggling over your sexuality. Um, I'd say probably close to 10% at least of Jehovah's Witnesses struggle with that and are oppressed by the fact that, you know, we have these rules in place. Um, You're not alone. Uh, reach out to us at survey, reach out to the Reddit XJW group. Um, Know that we care. We're not angry apostates. Um, We want the truth. 
Uh, one of the things I told my wife when I was leaving, and, and, we, and by the way, we started taking long walks. So we started walking three or four miles a night. And then we ended up walking uh, eight to 10 miles <clears throat> almost every night. We racked up thousands of miles in the past three or four, you know, three or 4,000 miles a year and then started biking and we would, you know, bike 20 or 30, 40 miles into Pennsylvania and stay at a bed and breakfast. And she started asking questions. And um, so be patient because when you do that, that allows people to hear themselves think out loud for the first time and you know, know that your feelings are valid. Uh, know that um, the answers are out there. And I, I told my wife, I said, look, I, I would rather be wrong and for Jehovah's Witnesses to be right, that there's going to be a resurrection and all of my friends, except for me, are going to be in paradise earth. If that's true, then I'm happy for that to be true. Now, it's not true, but I told her, I said, look, I'd rather for you and all my friends to be happy in this paradise earth, petting pandas and having your dead loved ones back again, if I'm wrong, but you've got to prove me wrong, you know, and if you do, I'll turn back, you know, I'll go back to the organization if they're right and they're not right. They can't be right. There's just too many things that they're wrong about. Um, I told her I took two steps back from religion, and this is not for everyone. Uh, I took a step back from the organization, and I took a step back from religion itself because I saw that as the root cause. It wasn't just some you know, elder I didn't disagree with. It wasn't the organization necessarily, but it was what caused all of it. The, the, uh, the Adventist movement in the 1850s that restructured Christianity for millions and millions of people who believed that Christ was coming, whether visibly or invisibly. And, you know, Miller and all these people that were waiting for the Messiah to come and, and Russell was among them. And he, he created a, a movement out of it, which became Jehovah's Witnesses with more than 8 million members. So, you know, that, that was what I told my wife. I said, look, if, I, if I'm wrong, oh, I, I'm fine with that. But otherwise, I'm not wrong. And I'm interested in truth, and I'm interested in transparency. Let's be transparent. Let's not hide these documents. There doesn't need to be a, a secret elder's manual. There doesn't need to be all these rules and regulations. You know, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you know that, you know, he didn't make up all these rules. He, he built Christianity upon principles, you know, if you believe that story. So I'll, I'm going to say this. Not everybody can be an activist. What you and I do, it takes a lot out of us. It's very difficult. It, it runs our lives. And the only reason we keep doing it is because we get those letters day in and day out from people who say, you changed our lives. Thank you very much. That's what keeps us going. You know, it's not about recognition or money or about anything like that, because you and I could make a very good living in this world if we had gone off, you know, left this activism behind and gone off to do whatever, you know, become an artist, an engineer, whatever. But we take a very, very, you know, small amount of money to do what we do and keep it going. So, um, and look, uh, so many, uh, I've reconnected with so many people from my childhood who are thriving. You know, one of my best friends, a girl named Tracy lives up in Vermont. She was- Did she uh, ever give you a card? Um, <laughs> so, actually we were, we were very platonic friends, you know, really of good friends. Of course you were. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, it's funny about Tracy was, and, and there were a lot of JW girls I dated before I, I found the right one. And, um, but no, Tracy was a friend of mine that, uh, we, you know, from Vermont, we went on ski trips together and <clears throat> did lots and lots of things. So she left the organization. I remember sitting, uh, I'd helped her fix her battery in her car, wouldn't start. It was a rainy, rainy day. And we, we went over, I don't know, I went over to the place where she was broken down in front of a restaurant. And I said, Tracy, what's going on? You know, because she, she had been a pioneer and, and she stopped going to meetings. You know, she's like, you know, 21, 22 years old, one of my best friends. And uh, I said, what's going on, Tracy? You know, and she's like, I, I don't believe this anymore. You know, it, I don't, none of it's true. You know, I don't believe in God. I, I just, you know, I'm done. I'm done with it. And I'm like, well, Tracy, and I thought, 
I didn't really have anything I could say because I found myself not wanting to repeat what an elder would say. You know, I thought, you know, here's what an elder would say, but this is my friend. Her feelings are real. And my God, I think she's right about some things, but I can't tell her that, you know, and it was pouring down raining and it was just, you know, here's my friend telling me that she's never going to be a Jehovah's witness again. She had just stopped pioneering, just stopped going to meetings and I'm helping her with her car. And, and um, she was never disfellowshipped. She left, she went, got married, never heard from her again until a few years back, come to find out she married a really nice guy. He's up in Vermont. She has, you know, um, uh, four, three, three boys and just the most beautiful family and the most wonderful life. She's not involved in activism at all. Don't want her to be, she doesn't need to be. She's living her genuine, true life that she needs to live and not everybody can be an activist. So, you know, to people like Tracy and uh, everyone that's living their authentic life, go ahead and do that. You know, we have to do what we have you to would. do. If, if, you, if you can get to that point, some people move on by doing activism and some people move on just by living their own authentic life. Either way, you've won, haven't you? Yeah, you, you have. You, you know, just... Uh, I think the expression is, you know, a life well lived is really the best uh, mm. defense to people, you know, that go after ex witnesses and say, see, you left Jehovah, what, you know, just live a good life, you know, be yourself, be kind to others. If you want to have faith in God, that's fine. You know, we, we don't object to that, you know, let, that's a whole separate issue. Mm. But the important thing is that there is no, you know, there is no organization on earth that should be directing your life, uh, such as the Watchtower Society. And I, it took me a while to realize, you know, the cognitive dissonance and the behavior control and all the things that I was under it took me a long time to realize that, you know, that had controlled my life more than I realized. Mm. And um, so now I'm going to try to help other people get out. Excellent. Well, you're doing an amazing job of that. And uh, likewise, I'm also very pleased I can now call you Mark on Watchtower in Focus because <laughs> it's been a nightmare remembering that. Okay. So, what, thank you so much for sharing your story. And again, thank you for the amazing work that you do on JW Survey and on Watchtower in Focus. Uh, I'm sure everyone has enjoyed hearing your story. Yeah. If you, if you don't have a, uh, um, if you want to communicate on Facebook, I don't have a, a real Facebook account. I'm still John Redwood, but you know, you can just find, find me on John Redwood or, uh, I'm finally taking your advice and joining the Twitter club under, uh, Mark J O'Donnell with underscores in between yeah. on Twitter. So I'm learning the Twitter ropes a little bit and, sure. um, you could find me there, but, uh, you are around. Some- <clears throat> there's some upcoming articles on JW survey. You'll be interested in reading about, uh, with the Montana case. And, uh, but I want to thank you Lloyd for involving all of us in this because it's a group, um, venture, you know, none of us are an Island. You know, we are a group of people who care about other people and we wouldn't do this if we didn't realize how dangerous this religious control over people's lives is it, it, for Jehovah's Witnesses, people lose their lives because of the blood policy. They lose their education because of the education policy, and they lose their own self-identity. So, you know, get out there, live your authentic self. Don't beat yourself up that you're being selfish. You're not. This is who we are as human beings. Help others. Be a good person. And look, you know, we're we're not angry atheists or, or angry apostates. Um, you know, we're kind caring individuals who want to help people and you know that's the message that i'd like to give indeed well thank you so much again and viewers if you've enjoyed this interview please don't forget that you can see more interviews and indeed more videos of various subjects by subscribing to the john cedars channel but for now i do hope you've enjoyed this and as always thank you for watching